Welcome to Grant Writing Simplified with Teresa Huff. If you're a freelance grant writer, an aspiring grant writer, or wondering if a career in grant writing is right for you, you're in the right place. For more great resources on grant writing, head over to TeresaHuff.com. But before you do, make sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on any of the great videos to come. Welcome to the Grant Writing Simplified Podcast. This is the place to learn how to make a big impact in your community through grant writing and nonprofit consulting. The world needs you to step forward as a grant writer and use your skills to lead with confidence. I'm Teresa Huff, former special ed teacher turned grant writer and nonprofit strategist. In my 20 years of freelancing, I've helped nonprofits triple their funding and exponentially increase their reach. Now I'm stepping up to mentor freelancers and nonprofit leaders like you who are ready to take your skills to the next level. It's time to get intentional about your vision so you can create lasting change in your community. Learn the skills and strategies you need to become the grant writer the world needs. Let's do this. Hey friends, welcome back. We are heading into November, the last two months of the year. It's hard to believe 2022 is almost over. It's exciting and I don't know about you, but I am ready to finish the year strong. I think there's a lot of work to do and a lot of good that we need to be doing in the world. So let's join together and do it. And we need to encourage each other along the way. If you are on the fence about grant writing, I want to invite you to, first of all, take the quiz on my website. Do you have what it takes to be a grant writer? But then also I want you to consider joining me in the fast track to grant writer, the VIP program. This is an interactive mentoring program, and this is the perfect time to join. So you can start learning now and hit the ground running in 2023 with some new skills as grant writer. I'm rolling out some amazing new features this fall to help you gain traction and build your successful grant writing career. You can even choose to earn a digital certificate or university credit through this program. You can sign up and start learning today at teresahuff.com slash VIP. A couple of years ago, I needed a new water bottle, (laughs) but it couldn't be just any water bottle. I was on a quest. It had to be just right. I drink a lot of water. I take water with me everywhere I go. I drink water all day long. (laughs) My family just knows water is a big part of my life. And so the right water bottle is an important decision. It seems like a small thing, but it's kind of a big thing. You know, it has to be just right. I wanted just the right color, the right size, the right lid, the right spout. It had to fit in the cup holder in the car. Didn't want it to be too expensive either though. It needed to keep the water cold all day long had to have a little handle. The brand didn't matter so much. As long as it had all these other requirements, it had to be just right. (laughs) I kind of sound like Goldilocks, don't I? Not asking for much. But finally, I found what I thought might be the perfect combination. So I decided to give it a try, added it to my Christmas list, and my husband was happy to check it off his list. And (laughs) it's my favorite water bottle. Somehow, randomly though, along the way, I started to learn about the company and it's called Simple Modern and I was really intrigued because this wasn't just a water bottle producing company. They are all about giving generously and giving back to communities in a big way. And it is a company, it's a business, but yet they are doing a lot of good and making a big social impact. So I connected with the CEO and the founder on LinkedIn and I invited him on the show. And today I am talking with Mike Beckham. He is, as I mentioned, the CEO of Simple Modern. He is full of wisdom on both leadership and nonprofits and entrepreneurship because he has sat in both seats. He was in a nonprofit for years and he's also been running his company for years. Mike gives us a lot of guidance on how skills in both the for-profit world and the non-profit world can translate to each other. And he talks about how we can develop quality of life and corporate culture and what factors help create a successful organization. I hope you enjoy this episode as much as I did. 
Mike, welcome to the show. I am excited to sit down and chat with you today. Before we start, tell us a random fact about yourself. Uh, okay, a random fact about myself. Uh, one is that I'm pretty skinny. I weigh like 160 pounds, but for some reason I have very large calf muscles. And so that was my nickname in high school was calves. And when people meet me for the first time, that's usually one of the things they remark on. So that's, that's a truly random fact. Wow. That is random. And it's got me curious to go look up pictures of you online <laughs> to see if you have these calves on display. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure there are some somewhere. Uh, I hope- <laughs> I haven't, I haven't been able to delete them all yet. Yeah. You probably wished you could as a teenager, but that's awesome. <laughs> it's amazing how God makes all shapes and sizes. Yes, absolutely. You just go it's, with it's it. funny because when you're a, when you're a guy, you know, women are constantly like, how do I lose weight? And men are always like, especially when they're younger, they're like, how do I get bigger? How do I add muscle? And I've, I've just always been skinny and except for my legs. And it's funny because, you know, my son, he's really skinny And I remember when we first had him and I realized where he was on the growth chart, I was like, man, why is he so skinny? And then my wife was like, hey, I mean, look at you, look at me. Like, what did you expect? It's like, okay, you're right. I I have this self-image of myself as somehow bigger than I am. (laughs) Yeah, it's funny. If we could see ourselves the way others see us, we might have a whole different perspective, good or bad. (laughs) So speaking of perspective, I know you bring a lot of different perspectives to the table, which is why I was excited to talk to you today, because you have some nonprofit background, you have some business background, and now entrepreneurial, and Mm -hmm. a really good combination of those and stepping into a leadership role where you can pull in the mix of both sides of that. So tell us a little bit about your story and how you got here. Yeah, absolutely. So I... uh went to college at the University of Oklahoma in Norman and uh, was there for five years. I had a a scholarship that paid for five years. So I took all five years. Nice. And, um, you know, I think college was for, as it is for most people, it was a really life-changing and shaping event for me. And about halfway through college, I would say I had a fairly major worldview uh, reset. Uh, There was a real spiritual component to it. Um, and then that was followed by discovering finance, which I had always done pretty well in school, but I had never had a subject uh, that just came as naturally as and intuitively as finance did. I met my wife. And so the first my first half of college, what I tell people is I looked like probably like a typical frat guy with a little bit better grades. And then I had a very different looking second half of college. Um, and as I got towards graduation, what I really thought I was going to do was probably something in the for-profit world, I thought that, you know, maybe I can help make a difference in the world by being able to give generously, uh, use my finance skills. And so the the two options that I considered the most heavily were going and getting a degree in the marketplace, uh, doing finance, or actually getting a PhD in finance and teaching. I really have a passion for teaching. It's one of the reasons I like to do things like this. And my wife had one more year. She was doing a master's in accounting and Uh, So she had another year of school after we got married and this opportunity opened up for me to do a one year internship with this nonprofit ministry called crew. And uh, you know, even today it's kind of surprising to me that I said yes to that, but that's what I ended up doing. I thought, you know, doing a year of this being around campus while my wife is finishing her degree, this would be great. And then I'll go into industry and uh, I had to raise my support, uh, raise my salary to to do that opportunity. Uh, it was eighteen thousand dollars. I struggled to raise it. Uh, I didn't have like some amazing fundraising network, and surprisingly, I loved it. Like I loved investing in people. My job really being helping other people uh, to grow and, and pouring my time into other people. And one year, which I thought I was just sure after that year was over, I was going to go, you know, work in finance. One year turned into two, turned into 10. And I did really my entire 20s in the nonprofit world. And by the time I got to 30, it was uh, fairly evident to me that I would never get to the business world. You know, nobody's knocking down my door to to hire me into a finance role. I, I, I was eight or nine years removed, you know, from getting a degree in finance. And I loved being in the ministry. Right around that time, my younger brother, he's about two and a half years younger than me, approached me. Uh, he had been doing some internet marketing. He had kind of a one-person business. 
that had done pretty well, but he really had an idea for a company uh, with, with another guy and said, Hey, would you help us start this? And so I thought that sounds like a really fun side project. I'm really enjoying ministry, but I, and being in the nonprofit world, but I'd be happy to use some of the skills I have as like a little, you know, side project. And we started a company, it was an online auction company. And that company grew over its first 13 months from inception to having million dollar revenue days. Um, I was the oldest person at the company. I was 31 at the time. And so you can imagine it was a little bit of, number one, we were so we were so green and so naive that we didn't even realize how absurd it was, the level of success that the company was having. But also, uh, you know, I, as being the oldest person at the company at 31, it was a situation where I, uh, it was a little bit like the inmates running the asylum, you know, like everybody in the company was, was in their twenties, uh, and we were all kind of trying to figure it out. So, uh, in that context, I'm now working in this ministry that's growing really quickly. I'm working in this e-commerce startup that's growing really quickly. And then we got pregnant with our first child, my son, Carter, who's right over my shoulder here. And I just realized, wow, I'm not going to be able to be excellent at being a husband and a father and and at, at the level I want to be at my job if I'm doing all of these things simultaneously. Um, and that led my wife and I down a path where we decided, hey, I, I actually feel called into the business world. Went and worked with my brother for a few years. We started several more companies that ranged from not very successful slash failures to uh, reasonably successful um, learned a ton along the way. And uh, by about 2015, I felt like I wanted to do uh, something different that I either wanted to go back into the nonprofit world or maybe start a company where I could set culture and uh, mission. And so a couple of guys that I'd worked with uh, over the previous several years um, that I, I just really enjoyed them, their character, the culture we had had working together. Uh, the three of us started what has turned into modern, and that's what I do today. Pause here and say that you have to be hearing that, right? Are you hearing all that craziness? Slightly. Only really? Slightly. That's amazing. Okay, well, that's awesome yeah. because, I mean, it is like, it, it, it's like, sounds like somebody is just throwing a bowling ball against the wall over and over again. And I'm like, this has to be driving her crazy. Well, that's great. If no, it's not, it just, it's like you know. just a tiny little scratching in the background just okay. barely so. okay great so um i'll i'll kind of uh you know uh, I, I guess we can kind of put that one there and you can ask another question but that's how i got all the way to simple modern so it's basically okay. um about 10 years in the nonprofit world about three or four years where i was kind of doing both and then the last 10 years or so has been really exclusively focusing on running a business and my involvement in the nonprofit world has been much more giving and volunteer based. Mm -hmm. So you kind of have seen a whole 360 view of nonprofit work and business work and being really able to integrate the two. Yeah. And I've been able to see the common threads, right? Like what are the principles uh, that help make a successful nonprofit or for-profit? There's a lot of, and then there's some things that are contextual where it's like, this is really, there's a right way or a better way to approach it in a nonprofit context. And there's a different, more effective way to approach it in a for-profit context. And then there are these principles where it's, hey, re regardless really of whether it is a for-profit or a nonprofit, these things matter and they help build better culture and better teams. Um, so for me, that's been the fascinating thing is pulling those things out. Um, and, you know, we can talk about this more if you'd like to, but I think that a lot of my abilities as a leader, I'm more effective as a leader in the for-profit world because I first led in the nonprofit world where you really don't lead through things like compensation and title. You lead through vision casting and um, team dynamics and culture. And because I learned those things, that actually translates really well to the for-profit world where a lot of for-profit companies, it's almost exclusively compensation and role to motivate people. And so if you can bring some of these tools from the nonprofit world, you're actually a much more for-profit leader. 
I agree so much with what you're saying. And I see, I bring a lot of that into my consulting as well with nonprofits, because sometimes they start a nonprofit with business skills, but have no idea how nonprofits work. And there are a lot of transferable skills, whether it's for a nonprofit leader or a grant writer, but then there are a lot of unique things specific to nonprofits. And so we try to pull in and translate, but what you're saying about the mission and really being driven by that bigger vision. That's so critical in a nonprofit, but why not apply that to businesses as well? And I feel like there can be a lot of cross learning from one industry to the other. And Teresa, one of the things that I think in the for-profit world gets missed a lot is ultimately for-profit companies are about people and it's the organizing and motivating and cooperating of people. And motivating people, if if you develop the skills and the ability to motivate people, you're going to be effective in the business world. And uh, that many business leaders just haven't ever gotten a chance to really develop those those muscles. Um, And in the nonprofit world, I, I think that the opposite can be true sometimes where there's, uh, there's incredible heart and lots of heart, but sometimes the follow through isn't there. And that's one of the business skills that can translate really well. You know, the for-profit skills that can translate to the nonprofit world is helping nonprofit leaders think in terms of measurement and, um, you know, reality is your friend, uh, that, sometimes difficult conversations are a part of getting where you want to go that, um, you know, it, it is, it, it is about having the right vision, but it's also about the work that you put in, you know? And so I, I think each of the, each of the industries can kind of fall off one end of the spectrum on, on the business side. You can have great execution and questionable kind of character and heart behind it. On the nonprofit side, you can have great heart, but really questionable execution sometimes. But in any organization where you can bring those two things together, whether it's a for-profit or not-for-profit, it's going to be really effective. I agree so much. And I know our podcast listeners can't see me, but I'm nodding my head. I feel like a bobblehead doll (laughs) because I agree with so much with what you're saying. And I see it so much. I see the struggles and I see the gaps. And I feel like a lot of those pieces on a very practical level would help the the opposites so much with that Mm -hmm. aspect of that and with their growth, because a lot of organizations are spinning their wheels and they get to the point where they can't move forward and they can't figure out why they're stuck. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's those strategic pieces, whether it's communication. And you said something really, I think, pivotal of the motivation piece. A lot of people don't think about what is going to motivate people. They just think, oh, we'll offer a bonus or we'll offer this incentive, but they don't realize people are wired much differently. Sometimes we need deeper meaning. We need businesses with heart. We need those other elements, not just that external motivation. So what I think everybody's after in life, Teresa, is quality of life. And quality of life is complex and it's multifaceted. And the more that we as leaders think deeply about what produces quality of life, the the more effectively we're going to be able to lead others and help them experience quality of life. And we actually know through research what most of the answers are. Quality of life definitely can come from having adequate finances. When we we don't have enough finances, that creates stress and that, that drags on quality of life. But most of our quality of life does not come primarily from finances. Sometimes finances can help uh, set the stage for some of these other things to happen. But quality of life comes from putting time towards something that you believe matters and that you believe makes a positive impact in the world. Having meaningful relationships and community, both inside and outside of your career whatever that is, having autonomy and the ability to make decisions, being able to see the direct result of the work you put into something and the impact that that has on the lives of other people or on the outside world, Um, having the ability to learn and being in an environment 
as you're doing your work, you're seeing growth and progression internally. These are all examples of things that drive quality of life. So one of the things that I've learned over the years is how diverse the number of things are that, that drive quality of life, how most of them are non-financial. And even, you know, just to give an example, even when we talk about how finances can drive quality of life for us, uh, it's amazing to me that you can give $500 to someone who's a, a team member or an employee. You could give it to them four different ways and it could feel, uh, it could have a very different impact. You know, one is like it just shows up on their paycheck and, you know, it's it just goes into their bank account. One is you show up at their office and you say, hey, this is a five hundred dollar gift card because the contribution you've made to the team, the way that you have helped develop other leaders, the impact you're making. And I just wanted to say thank you. Another one is, you know, a gift on their work anniversary or something that's thoughtful. Like so it's not even actually about the quantity of money. It's actually even the way that we deploy that can communicate a lot that really impacts the quality of life that we take from that. Um, another one I didn't even mention earlier is affirmation and the the kind of environment when it comes to encouragement or the way that people talk to us. Um, that actually is a huge part of quality of life. So one of the messages I have to people, really, it's interesting. I talked to two groups of people that are very similar, uh, but doing different things. I talked to a lot of entrepreneurs and I talked to a lot of nonprofit leaders. And neither of them have anybody, right? And so it's like they're these are two groups that are like building something where re, they're resource constrained. And so what I try and do is help to demystify and simplify what are a lot of the things that you can do that really will help create a successful organization, a healthy culture that will drive a lot of quality of life for you and the people around you that aren't resource dependent uh, and even when you are using your resources, how do you get the most, how do you, how do you create the most out of those resources? You know, I, I know this is kind of the theme of your podcast, but I'll, I'll bridge that to the larger idea, which is this, when you're fundraising for a nonprofit, what you're really doing is you're casting vision to others about why you're a good investment, why they would want to invest their dollars in you. And now that I'm sitting on the side where I'm I'm more the person writing those checks, what I'm looking for is I'm looking for people that I think are just really good stewards. They're creative and they're able to use the get the most out of the resources they're given to drive the most positive impact. Right. So when you're able to demonstrate that actually even without money, you're able to drive a lot of positive impact and that you're the type of person who's thoughtful and creative in how you use resources, that will actually draw more resources in because that makes people want to invest in you. It makes people want to give towards your cause. So ironically, some of the way that you get better at being able to raise money is becoming very effective at not first needing money, at being able to really achieve a lot without money. And ironically, paradoxically, that when people see that, that makes them want to give you more money because they see the effectiveness of you as a leader. And that makes them want to invest in that. You just busted one of the most common grant myths <laughs> that I hear so much is people thinking, Ooh, maybe we shouldn't tell them about the money we have, or they'll think we don't need this grant or this donation, but it's actually the opposite. If they see others are investing in you and think you're worth investing in and you're stable Absolutely. and sustainable, it's going to draw their attention and build your credibility and trust with Absolutely. them. When I think about organizations that we give to, I don't primarily think about scale and how much resources they have or how big or small are they. I think about how effective are they? And so if there's an organization that's a multi-billion dollar organization that is incredibly effective, I have no qualms with adding even more money to the organization. And if there's an organization that has an operating budget of $20,000 annually, but they are making a real difference, I have no qualms with adding to that. I think the, the thing that the only limitation that I, donors will sometimes think about is they don't want to necessarily be a disproportionate amount of your funding. And that's what, you know, that's probably the only thing to be mindful of is 
if if you do have a twenty thousand dollar annual operating budget, it's it is going to be met with some skepticism if you ask for fifty thousand dollars from somebody because there's not going to be the clarity that you're going to be able to steward that amount of money or that the organization might be over dependent on that grant. And often there's a hesitancy to give money where you might create a dependence or a situation where if you can't give, it just takes that organization under. So, but outside of that, I think you're right. I mean, in the business world, the companies that fundraise the easiest are the companies that lead, need the money the least. It's a, it's a paradox, mm -hmm. right? Right. Everybody wants to put their money in the company that's already profitable and doesn't need money because it feels like a sure thing. And in the nonprofit world, it's the same thing. People want to invest in winners and in things that they feel like are effective and successful. So it's a big part of casting vision for donors is helping them to understand how you have been a good steward and how you have effectively deployed resources and how given more resources, you're just going to be able to create that much more impact. Exactly. And it reminds me of the concept of being faithful with the small things. If you only have $5,000 or $20,000, be faithful, be good stewards with that. And then you'll be given more and more. And as you continue to be faithful and good stewards, it will grow. You're, you're making a great point. And th this is a really tactical way to apply this. Um, never say if we just had more money, we would be more effective. Mm -hmm. I, I, I feel like I've heard that a bunch that, you know, like, oh, if we had just, if we just had a little bit more money, we would get that breakthrough or that whatever. Effective leaders do not say that. Mm -hmm. Effective leaders can say, hey, with more money, we've got ideas of how to deploy it. And we think we can go to the next level or whatever else. But when you use it as an excuse of like, what's actually holding us back is, is just resources at this point. Um, it feels like that. It feels like an excuse. Whereas what we really want to be communicating is at this level of resources, we've been faithful, we've made wise decisions, and we've really hel helped to drive impact. And with more resources, that's just going to accelerate and enlarge the impact that we're already making, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. And that comes back to, like you're saying, and stressing, it's really casting that clear vision and making it compelling, something that people want to be a part of. And I know you have, you've been in the trenches with nonprofits and now you have grown this company pretty quickly. So how are you using these concepts company-wise to be on the other side of things where you're giving back through your company. And I know this yeah. is a concept I'm hearing more and more of is the social impact type of space as opposed to a nonprofit or strictly a business. People are still feeling compelled to somehow give back and give generously. So tell us a little more about how you're doing that. Yeah, so I think we're a little bit of a hybrid, Teresa. I think we sit almost in the world between for-profit and non-profit. Uh, I'll tell people sometimes I'm I'm like a non-profit refugee in the for-profit world. And our team has, I would say 75 to 90% of our team, if I added it up, has worked in the non-profit sector for at least a year or two. So I'm not necessarily an anomaly with our team. The ways that it's applied for us, one is at a company level, like mission level, we've we've set the company mission as we exist to give generously. And the way that we think about it is that for-profit companies tend to really serve one constituent, which is the shareholder and everything. And then it's like a big gap to number two. Um, the way that we think about it is there's a lot of different constituents that the company impacts. It is shareholders, but it's our customers, it's our employees, it's our community, uh, it's the partners that we work with, and all of them matter. And that the point of the company is to serve all of those constituents so that they all thrive as a result of the company. And we're looking at how can we be generous across all those different dimensions? What does that look like? A, a small example is that we do say, and I guess it's not small, but it's the most obvious one is we give 10% of profits annually, which when you're in a business growing like ours, where it needs inventory, it is a significant sacrifice. This mm -hmm. last year, we were able to give uh, over a million dollars in cash donations. And then we give a lot of product donations as well. That's amazing. And 
It's it's great. You know, we have an annual giving week where we have partners come in and present about their their nonprofits. The the organization gets to hear all of those things and then they get to share feedback with our giving committee that makes allocations. And then we have a portion of our giving that's just divided up among every employee equally and employees are able to make their own decisions about what uh, nonprofits they would like to give those funds to. Um, but I think generosity should include writing checks and to start with writing checks or grants, but it, it can be a lot more holistic than that. It is taking everything you have and saying, okay, everything I have, I want to use it for the benefit of others. And, and what does that look like? So for me, some examples would be, okay, I've been fortunate enough to be in some situations where I learned a lot about scaling a business or healthy culture or some of these things. So I'm going to do a podcast. I'm going to teach, I'm the entrepreneur in residence at the University of Oklahoma. I'm going to teach some, I'm going to help mentor some people that want to start businesses. Uh, you know, another example we talk about is generosity with our, our skill sets and our words that we can, our ability to speak life into people, help develop other people, coach them, and encourage them. It's just kind of a question of how much are we willing to put in the effort to do those things. But these are things that can be transformative in people's lives. So we're trying to build a culture of generosity where there is an open handedness with everything we have and saying we want to use it for the benefit of other people. Uh, and that's a very nonprofit type idea, but it's living in this for profit company where as a result of us operating a successful for profit company, which does take an additional set of muscles and skills, uh, we are able to have higher impact and broader impact. Um, instead of needing to raise money as we grow the company, that's actually providing more resources that we're actually able to be generous with. And then we're able to do things like, you know, volunteer as a company with, you know, different nonprofits uh, and find different ways to make a positive impact in the community. It's also been part of the motivation for us getting into domestic manufacturing is that it's another opportunity for us to express generosity, um, creating jobs and, and having a positive impact on the local local economy. Those are so many creative ideas and ways to incorporate your culture of generosity. And it really takes deliberate focus and intentionality to do that. I think sometimes organizations just get in the status quo of this is how things are done. And they forget that we can be creative. We can make this different. Yes. We can bring in a fun, cool culture that gives back and lights people up to come to work every day. And I love the simplicity of your mission. Sometimes we tend to overcomplicate and think we have to throw in every aspect of our programs right, right. or our work, but it just, we exist to give generously. I mean, that is memorable and powerful and your employees can come to work every day with that in their heads. Like this is why we're here. And then that can drive your decision-making throughout the day. Yeah. And, you know, it took us a while to get to that. It, we we started out actually being too complicated with our mission. And then we realized being clear and memorable was the, the right way to approach it, to distill it down and make it as straightforward and digestible and understandable as possible. Um, and that's actually just, a, I mean, it's a key part of fundraising right? Is it's not just being about good things. It's not just about being effective. It's about the ability to communicate it and honing that ability. Mm -hmm. And I think both during my time in the nonprofit world and then now running a for-profit company that is a, a consumer brand, it is so critical that we're able to clearly communicate why we're different and why people should care. And so one example that, that I learned when I was raising funds to work in the nonprofit world, we would do an, like a monthly letter to financial supporters. And I struggled for a while to understand exactly what I wanted to do with that letter and what would be most effective. And it took probably six months or a year to realize the single most effective thing I could do was simply have a student that I had invested in to just write their experience. That was it. 
Mm-hmm. I didn't give them any coaching. It was just like, hey, would you be willing to write one page about how this has impacted your life? And what I found was that was the most compelling way to cast vision for donors, mm-hmm. that they were able to say, okay, I understand when I send in this $50 check that it's making possible for you to spend your time doing this exact thing. And I have a tangible, concrete understanding of how that's impacting somebody's life. Uh, and as I read these stories, I get excited about that. And it makes me you know, passionate and committed to continuing to give towards this. That's fantastic. And that's so simple. I mean, that is a super simple, but powerful strategy right there. Right. It's, we can, we can definitely overcomplicate it, Mm -hmm. right? People, people want to invest in things that they think are successful and that they're good investments or resources. They want to invest in things where they're able to make tangible connections, the more tangibly connected they are to the work that you're doing and our job at, when we're in the nonprofit world is helping them to, to see that, to see mm-hmm. the effectiveness and to see the impact and to making it concrete and relatable and clear. And the, the more effectively we do that, the easier it is to raise resources. Exactly. You're painting that compelling picture. So it's crystal clear. Well, along those lines, I know you have had tremendous experiences, education, a lot of background. So tell us, has there been a resource that has been particularly meaningful to you in your journey? And let me ask a clarifying question. A resource when it comes to fundraising or just development internally? How would you anything. how would you define that? Anything. anything. Is there anything okay. that just really sticks out that has been a pillar or an anchor for you in your either side any of well I, i'll say two things one thing is i think having great mentors is something i've really benefited from and i think that everyone benefits from having a mentor but it it requires us being deliberate and us to seek them out in our lives mm-hmm. and i try to have a bias towards yes when people ask for mentorship of some kind from me even though my schedule is quite full these days because Uh, I know the impact that it can make. And uh, I would encourage everybody, regardless of where you're at in your career, finding people who can speak into your life and can pour into you is a game changer and developmentally has been very helpful. Um, And at the very least, even if it's not an older mentor, someone who can be a mirror to you, can reflect back to you what they see and help you to see areas for growth. The second thing I'd say, which is more general as a principle, is that we just live in a society that's awash with information. And there are there's just almost an infinite number of good resources about just about anything that are out there and available for free somewhere on the internet. And the key is developing a love of learning and a growth mindset where we engage and sort through and find those things and become self-feeders that uh, more than, hey, there's this one book that totally changed my life or this one principle. It's been more developing the love of learning and the willingness to constantly push myself and the realization that we just live in a, a period in human history when we can grow and get better in just about any area. Like we have access to the tools and the information, but it is a lot about want to. And it's it's about, you know, are we going to have the personal discipline and drive to actually do that? Over years, that compounds and makes a big difference. And it ends up defining a lot of what our character looks like and, and how effective we are in our, our careers and, uh, and our relationships. So true. And again, like with financially, if we are faithful in the small things, it's true in learning as well. If we're faithful to learn with the tools around us and what we can have access to, and then just keep growing more and more. And it grows because as the more you learn, the more you actually have the capability to learn things that you really wouldn't have been able to before. One of the things that I I will tell people is that I, I have the ability to reach some shelves from a leadership perspective or a business perspective, that I just couldn't have five or 10 years ago. And the only reason, and, and that some of my peers that I went to college with probably can't today. And it's not because I'm smarter or special or anything. It's years and years of being in situations where I was really stretched and really challenged have compounded. And as those have built over time, I've just, I've, I've been surprised at some of the things I'm now capable of that would have been impossible, would have seemed impossible five or 10 years ago. 
And that's really not a testament to me in any on any level. It's testament to the power of compounding and how if we continually have a growth mindset, but over time we can look up and say, wow, how did I get here? How did I get to know this much about this subject? Or I really have become a better leader in this area where I've struggled and and that it's happened gradually through through slowly growing and, and that building on itself. Mm-hmm. Yes. And have you found, I know I've found that the more I teach and mentor, the more I start to learn from Absolutely. the people I work with. And then also it has that continuous compounding effect. It helps them and we learn from each other and we continue growing. And when you're in the early stages, it can seem so far away. And then, like you said, before you know it, you realize, oh, okay, that was actually preparing me for the next step. Even though you didn't know it at the time, you were just reading and learning and absorbing what you could. But down the road, you may pull from things that you never expected. For sure. There's an old saying, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? And the reality is real growth real transformation, real development in our life. Uh, These are big things and they don't happen all at once. They don't happen in a month. They happen gradually over time. They happen one bite at a time. And uh, I think the role that teaching has is every time I need to teach a concept, it forces me to develop a deeper understanding and a more clear understanding in my own head so that I can communicate it to others. And so every time I get to teach, I benefit as much as the people that are being taught because it's helping to clarify my thinking and it's helping me to continue to grow. Right. Having to prepare and do that research and the groundwork. Absolutely. Well, this has been a tremendous amount of information and I so appreciate you taking the time to share because I know you are extremely busy and leading a company and a lot going on. So thank you for bringing your insights today. I would love for you to tell us where people can connect with you online to learn more either about you and your leadership or Simple Modern or other resources that you have. Absolutely. So you can find Simple Modern products on on Amazon, Target, Walmart, Sam's Club. We're in a bunch of places. Uh, and on my to, desk right now. And on your desk, which I appreciate. <laughs> uh, and then if you want to follow me, uh, I'm the most active on LinkedIn and Twitter. On Twitter, my handle is uh, at Mike Beckham SM. And uh, I try and share these kind of principles and what I'm what I'm learning along the way. I have enjoyed following you and gleaning nuggets of wisdom throughout the week. So I really enjoy that and encourage people to follow you as well. Well, Teresa, thanks for having me on the show. I really appreciate it. Thank you. It's been an honor. All right, guys, what do you think? I want to leave you with a challenge question. Which one of Mike's tips and strategies will you implement this week? Pick one and start incorporating it into your everyday life. I would love to hear which one you choose. And so come message me over on LinkedIn or on my website, and let's keep the conversation going. If you are curious about grant writing and wondering if a nonprofit career is right for you, go take my quiz, Do You Have What It Takes to Be a Grant Writer, at teresahuff.com slash quiz. I'd love to hear about your vision for making a big impact on the world, because we need to be working together to do this. If this was useful for you, would you please go leave a review on Apple Podcasts to help others find the show as well. I hope you have a great week and take something here that you can use and go change your world.